Hello again, everyone. Sorry about the uh, having to break up this podcast. I had some technical issues that caused my uh, presentation to stop. So this is part two of unit one. So hopefully you figured that out from the, the files. And I just want to show you now how the obesity slides, um, how the patterns change over the next few years. So let's have a look now. So we're in 1994. This is a refresher. And the worst states were in the 15 to 19 percent range. And the bulk of the country was around 10 to 14 percent obesity. So let's go forward five years. So you can kind of see how the patterns change by year. Okay, so we've only gone five years. So the matter of time now that you've gotten into middle school perhaps in 1999. And now the worst states, and there are many of them here, are now 20 to 24 percent. And there's only one, two, three, four, five, six states left that are at the 10 to 14 percent range. Okay, let's go five more years. There's West Virginia starting to distinguish itself. Okay, so now we've only gone for 10 total years. Now the worst states are double what they were before, or very close to it. 25 to 29 percent, okay, including West Virginia, and the best states now are what the worst states were 10 years ago. So one thing you should be aware of or pay attention to here is this is a, a pattern that's affecting basically all 50 states at a little bit of a differential uh, rate. Obviously some states are having worse uh, primarily due to demographics uh, in many cases. So this path right here are some of the poorest states and the least educated states in the country. Um, and then other states, these states particularly along the, uh, the southern border here as well have high, some of the higher minority rates. So you have a double combination of perhaps the, a population with less access to resources, also lower income, uh, lower education. Okay, let's go forward to 2008, which is our current data, uh, the, what we have most recent. And now you have the majority of states, and some including greater than 30%. We have one, two, three, four, five, six states now greater than 30% when we had the bulk of the country 15, what we had 18 years, uh, 14 years ago, uh, only 10 to 14%. We have one state now that's left, that's Colorado, in the 15 to 90 that has less than 20 percent obesity. Everyone else, pretty much at least 25 percent obesity. So in 15 years you're seeing almost a doubling of those rates, which is amazing uh, if you think about it. So we really need to understand that this is not showing that in 20 years everybody got lazier. Because if that were the case, that would mean that you know it's your parents and their parents that were the people getting lazier. And I would argue that's not the case because people are really working hard. But it's a change of physical environment, and it's also a change of the socio-cultural environment in which people are working and living. Uh, so it's a combination of everything that has made this uh, our obesity rates increase at a higher rate than in most countries. Okay, and we are certainly among the worst. If you want to see where your state lies. Whoa, sorry about that. I can get it down here. Here we go. Scroll down. You can check out some of the statistics here um, for all the states. So you can see, as I mentioned, Colorado was among the lowest right here at about 18.5%. And West Virginia at this time in 2008 was among the highest. You know, Mississippi. Um, and Louisiana uh, regularly distinguish themselves well in this area. So Mississippi and West Virginia, top one or two <coughs> in terms of poor health statistics. And the reason I wanted to show you this information is so you have an understanding um, about what we're dealing with here. Now, I don't want to paint a terrible picture because the data in the last uh, couple years has actually been better showing improvements in uh, physical activity rates and showing kind of a leveling off of obesity. So in 2010, it hasn't gotten significantly worse. We've reached a point where 
we're at the top of the bulge maybe and we can show some improvement so um, but at the same time there's a lot of people working on this problem and hopefully there have been some interventions that uh, have started to curb this problem so if you want to get into the fight uh, there's plenty of room for you and you know, in, a, in a capitalist society in which we live uh, this will create opportunity uh, for people to work uh, in a positive way okay, so let's look back now at our slides So to summarize the first part of the unit here, our, our, our act, physical activity behavior and, and as well our food behavior is a combination of individual values, motives, abilities in a given environmental context. And in the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a tremendous change in the environmental context in which people work and live. Um, so if that's the case, if we want to change that, then we have to factor in all of it. We can't just you know tell people to be more motivated, and that's going to do it, or you know suck it up. Just you know, yeah, that does work. Um, you know, if you think of a like the most common thing people would see on TV would be like the Biggest Loser, right? Well, those folks are incentivized by the prize of fifty thousand dollars. They're also have a complete change in their environment, so they are not working. All they do is live there and eat and work out. So they have a total change in environment. They have a $50,000 $50, incentive and still many of them are not successful. Now many are, but it's totally not reality because ultimately people need to function within their own family environment. You can't take people away from their family for four months, you know, change them and then dump them back into the same toxic environment and expect to see change. So. Um, Yes, we can help individuals change, and I've done a lot of individual counseling work uh, to that result. But it's a struggle if we don't see some environmental change. I'm going to just give you an example of an environmental change. Environmental change might be something like uh, where you build a school. So let's say there's a new school built in Mon County here in Morgantown, and they put it right in the middle of town. Okay, they knock down some decrepit stuff. Um, on Grant Street or some of those other houses that are fire traps. They built a school right in the dead center of town and now thousands of kids can walk to that school or a thousand kids and they have easy access to it. Versus where they built University High out on Bakers Ridge Road several miles out of town and every single person man, woman, child will have to take a car or a bus to that school. That changed the environment did not have a positive impact on physical activity rates just so there could be a nice new school out there so that's an example of our environmental changes that we have to consider uh, because those are not having positive effects on public health so which path is most efficient environmental or policy change is the most efficient path if for example in West Virginia they passed a law that every single school chick kid between K and 12 would have to get one hour of physical activity Imagine the number of kids that that would influence in a given year. Yes, it would be a difficult policy to enforce. You'd have to have a lot of teachers. You'd have to change the school day. But every single kid, and that would be in a policy or environmental change, would be required to be active for 60 minutes a day. So those type of changes, yes, require significant effort and resources and money and time, but they also have the potential to impact hundreds of thousands of people. So. Uh, we need to focus less when we think about this problem on individuals motivation and more on the bigger picture so the second part of this unit let's have a look at um, some of the theories that help us understand um, how to help people change when you're working with them because so many of us uh, will be involved in individually, individually helping other people change their behavior, even though, of course, I emphasized before that it's important to help change the environment and to vote for uh, issues such as walkability, access to resources, living near schools, uh, these issues. But many of us will be employed as psychologists, counselors, you know, personal trainers, coaches, and we need to understand how we can help people change and how does that work. So we're going to look through some of these models quickly. Um, so you can have a better feel for that. At the foundation, you may have gotten this from your 272 class, for trying to change behavior, 
is two components the person and the situation uh, the person part is you know your personality your attitudes what do you know uh, and the situation is social support environment in which you live uh, how difficult is it going to be for you the barriers that you encounter and so when you're working with somebody you want to get a capture a little bit of both of these things you want to know what kind of a person you're working with what do they know what do they need to know what is their attitude what are their skill levels how much support do they have um, what's the environment in which they live for example where do they work what do they have access to near work is there a shower uh, could they ride their bike could they walk from work all of these simple but very important questions what kind of barriers are they encountering who's caring for the kids if they're going to go to the gym what what fits into their work schedule what doesn't some other other assumptions that you know it's hard to change habit it does take time and it takes a lot more than willpower to change and you may find this in your own uh, behavior change experience it typically takes a lot of good planning uh, it may even take uh, a rearrangement of your priorities to make a commitment towards uh, these specific behaviors um, as I mentioned earlier on in the lecture these theories they uh, they really guide your work as a psychologist um, otherwise if you have no theory then as you're listening to every single person then every single person is different if you have a thousand clients in a year you have a thousand different ways of interacting with that those clients uh, that becomes very inefficient if you have a good theory or two that you work with and it's in your brain every time you listen to someone now it gets filtered through the boxes in those theories and you're starting to organize the material already and therefore you're developing a plan for intervention in a much more efficient way and you just have to trust me that these are very useful things some of the theories we're going to look through are here <coughs> excuse me and these are detailed uh, in your text chapters three and four and you should definitely be familiar with these uh, for the first exam Um, one of the oldest theories um, from Jans and Becker back in the 1980s is just the idea that the pros of the behavior should outweigh the cons if you're going to do it. So why would I engage in physical activity? Benefits. Uh, well, how hard is it going to be? And then that recommends basically your intention, your likelihood of taking that action. So this can be applied to any particular health behavior, but as you can imagine as a younger person like it let's say uh, oh I should go get screened for cancer at 25 well I don't see any benefit of doing that in fact I might find something out that I don't want to know um, the cons are it's going to take time it's going to cost money Nah, I'm not likely to do that if you apply that to physical activity well what am I going to get out of this well I'm, I'd like to be more fit I'd like to lose weight but boy it's taking a lot of time and I don't really like to be active anyway um, I don't really like how I look when I put on my gym clothes you know so you have a person weighing the pros and the cons and then also then that would predict the intention to be physically active so it's a fairly simple model that's been integrated into other models but it doesn't offer a real complete picture of, of the behavior so it's a fairly simplistic explanation another model that's useful uh, that in predicts intentions to engage in a particular behavior is called protection motivation and it answers the basic question here just how much are we motivated to protect ourselves from future harm and it's more it's more uh, suitable to something like do do we use sunscreen or um, but we'll apply it to physical activity um, and it suggests that if we feel threatened that's that protection motivation that's the idea of protection motivation or we're protected to motivate ourselves and threatened in this case would be boy I'm gonna have a heart attack or uh, my family has diabetes and heart disease and this is a big problem so am I vulnerable to the issue and then how severe do I think that issue is you know getting a heart attack would be rated as pretty severe and then these threat appraisals are weighed out with well your ability to cope so self-efficacy is do I know what I'm doing do I feel confident to how to go be physically active, how to go lift weights, and then also is that going to do what I need it to do? So if I'm regularly active, will I then 
be more likely to get what I need. So I'm going to get healthier. It's going to reduce my risk, all of that. So it combines these threat appraisals and coping appraisals and suggests that these are predictive of intentions to be physically active. One area of physical activity this has worked well for is uh, injury rehabilitation. And it's been predictive of uh, athletes' likelihood to engage in physical activity to rehab their injury. So it's, it kind of links up, well, how vulnerable am I to future injury? How severe is my injury? And do I know what I'm supposed to be doing? And is my rehab going to work? So it integrates all those pieces and tries to predict how likely they are to adhere to being physically active. And that's the idea of protection motivation. So the health belief model and protection motivation suggests that you're going to exercise when you perceive that you're at high risk for cardiovascular disease and you're fearful if something's going to happen if you don't. Exercise as an intervention will be effective. Um, there's very few barriers and the person feels very capable of being uh, exercising regularly. This, but these particular models are much more uh, relevant to older populations who are already feeling some of these health issues but they don't apply as closely to younger populations such as college students. Okay, we're just going to skip over this part here because I think that's uh, uh, repeating the information there as well. Uh, but I will note that out of these particular models, self-efficacy, that is your, abil your belief that you can accomplish what you're being asked to do, and the barriers that you, um, that you perceive to that particular behavior are most uh, commonly associated. So those are the biggest things you want to be aware of when you're working with a client is what barriers do they perceive and how confident are they. And if they're not confident, we need to figure out how we can help them be more confident. Uh, a couple of other behaviors, uh, I'm so, sorry, a couple of other concepts that are relevant uh, come out of these two theories, which were the, created by the same guy. Um, they are the subjective norm and perceived behavioral control. I'll kind of highlight that down here. The subjective norm is a perceived social pressure to perform a particular behavior. And the perceived behavioral control is uh, whether or not you feel as though you actually have control over all your behavior choices. So as a college student, like going to the gym, generally you do have control over that. But let's say you don't live near the PRT and you have no car. So your perceived behavioral control of getting to the rec center might be quite low because you might have to depend on a friend, you might have to walk through some unsafe place, you might perceive very low behavioral control, as might you might have as a teenager who didn't necessarily could control the fact of whether you get to soccer practice or not as a 14-year-old, as um, you have very low behavioral control because it's kind of an important uh, concept to consider. The subjective norm, let's look a little bit closer at the subjective norm. So in your opinion, let's start kind of from smallest to biggest. What's the, what's the norm for being physically active and healthy in your family? You might just rate it from 1 to 10. But what is that norm? So, are your family members pressuring you to eat well or the opposite? Are they encouraging you and supportive of your being physically active or the opposite? And coming out of that, 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 that circle, what's it like in Morgantown? What do you think is the strongest pressure among college students? Is there pressure to be physically active? I think you could probably make a good argument that there's a pressure to look a certain way, particularly as a woman, to be young, to be fit, to be attra you know, perhaps to be attractive, but not necessarily to do it through physical activity. It wouldn't necessarily mean, matter which way you got there. As a guy, I think there's maybe a little less social pressure, but in my experience on WVU's campus, I've been in, in Morgantown for uh, 15 years now, the biggest pressure on students is to go out and to participate in um, social activities, particularly related to drinking. So that's an example of a social norm. In West Virginia, is there a strong pressure to be physically active? No. In the U.S., not really. So as I mentioned, the pressure really is to look a particular way, but emphasis is not necessarily put on uh, doing it in a healthy uh, wellness type of way. These theories look this way. So they suggest that, and they're basically only predictive of uh, individual uh, behavior, would be your attitude, 
the subjective norms for that particular behavior, and then perceived behavioral control, predicting your intention to be physically active. So we always want to get a sense of individual's attitude, the uh, norms uh, that they engage in, or they, they perceive, I'm sorry, uh, for that particular behavior, and then whether or not they have access to the things that they need uh, to execute the behavior. So how do we translate these theories in the previous theory? Uh, by, doing, by asking specific questions when you're working with somebody. That's how they come out. So when I'm interviewing someone, I might ask them about support and whether or not their family is encouraging of their physical activity or if they see people in their neighborhood being physically active. Those things would give me a sense of the subjective norm. I might also ask them about their attitude towards physical activity, including their barriers, what they expect is going to occur. So I'm trying to capture a, a full picture of any behavior that they're planning so I can understand whether I can intervene and how likely it is that they're going to be successful. Okay. Um, this model is somewhat useful, but it does miss um, it does miss some of the factors. However, it is more relevant for younger populations who have less control and choice over behavior, particularly adolescents, younger kids, even some college students as well. Um, but overall, the subjective norm has not been a strong predictor, with the exception of alcohol use. Uh, it has been quite a good predictor in that in that regard. Um, one of the models that I use most commonly and is probably the most uh, researched and validated model uh, over the last 20 years is called the trans theoretical model. And the reason it's called the trans theoretical model because it literally spans and basically just pirates all the concepts from the previous models and puts them together. Uh, and it's been widely researched. And it suggests that it's also sometimes called the um, model of readiness. It suggests that people who are different stages of readiness have different needs. And so we're going to look at through uh, some of these key concepts here. Um, some of the assumptions underlying the model is that you should match interventions or strategies that you're going to do with a person to the stage and target their ability to regulate uh, their own change. So it's very much focused on working with individuals. It doesn't focus at all on environmental change. There's other models for that. And if there's not appropriate interventions, most people will continue to be unsuccessful. So, you know, dropouts from most uh, exercise programs is around 50% um, in the first six months. And so without getting the right intervention, you can expect people to continue to struggle um, and, uh, and to not succeed. And so this helps you pick the right strategy for the right individual and to match uh, that to the individual. Um, the stages that you should be familiar with are these five stages, starting with the first, pre-contemplation. This person is not at all thinking about change. So this is a person who's not interested in being physically active, not even thinking about it. Nah, I don't think so. This is a person who does not want to quit smoking, likes smoking. Nah, I don't think I want to quit smoking. Um, the person who's now contemplating change would be in contemplation. Hey, I might change. You know, I really ought to quit smoking, or I'd like to be physically active. <coughs> Uh, but they have not yet done anything. So it's just a cognitive change between um, pre-contemplation and contemplation. I'll show you that visually in a moment. Preparation is, a, is the month before change. So it's a person who's making specific plans. They may have uh, started to exercise a little bit, but not regularly. So they're in preparation. They make some phone calls to the gym. They've, they've started to put things in motion, but they haven't gone full into it. Action is the initial six months after you initiate the change and is the most difficult stage to make it through because a lot of people drop out within that first six months. And then six months is, uh, uh, greater than six months is maintenance. So if you can get someone to be consistent in that six month period, then uh, they may reach maintenance, which is a, a much more stable stage. So across each of these stages, there may be specific strategies that are more effective um, for individuals. So for example, at pre-contemplation, if you have a look at the pros and the cons, in this situation here, the cons of change highly outweigh the pros of change. As you move into contemplation, there's a crossover that occurs. So now, they haven't really started to engage 
in anything. They haven't done any behavior, but now they've decided that, you know, this might be a good thing for me. So now the pros are high, cons are low, and then as you move towards action, they kind of come back together because it starts. you start to realize how difficult the behavior is to change. So this is the cognitive shift that occurs between pre-contemplation and contemplation. And I do encourage you to check this model out um, in your book as well to get a more um, clear explanation of the processes of change. So just as an example, in the pre-contemplation stage, something that might get a person into contemplation would be some sort of emotional experience. So maybe they, their dad or mom had a heart attack or their roommate lost 15 pounds and they started to look really good. And so they decide, you know what, maybe I ought to do that. This would be really good for me. And you know what, I might have time. The cons are lower. So they, they've now had a change in their mind, but not necessarily a change in their behavior. And so you, you need to help people have a change in their mind first. Then you need to help people prepare before they take action. This is a stage that's most likely to be skipped. Because we like to jump into action. Let's just go do it and we don't like to prepare. In preparation, you basically identify things that are going to help you uh, support your goals, and then you're going to identify the things that are going to disrupt your goals. And so when you're working with a client, you do both. Hey, who's going to support you? How's that going to work? And what's going to get in the way? And how can you prepare for those things before they occur? If you navigate preparation effectively, action is more likely to stick, and then you'll proceed most likely, hopefully, into maintenance. So definitely check those theories out and uh, have another read through the textbook as well prior to taking that. Um, in Unit 1, just to wrap up this podcast, you have several discussion posts, including your behavior change proposal that I talked about in the, in the introductory podcast as well. That behavior change proposal should be a specific measurable goal related to one of your diet or physical activity behaviors. Uh, you have a reading reaction assignment to the food fight readings, so check those out. Um, I think you'll really enjoy those readings. They're, they're, they're easy to read, and they talk about a lot of the issues that I mentioned at the front of this lecture. And then you have your first quiz due, uh, mostly on the textbook and also on uh, Chapter 1 from the food fight. I hope the uh, podcast has been useful for you. Uh, sorry I had to split it up into two pieces there, but uh, I think it's probably okay. You guys are all technologically savvy, and I look forward to uh, talking to you during Unit 2.